Oh, this night, O oh God, we gather with Jesus and the disciples to celebrate the Passover. On this night, we remember an upper room meal. On this night, we remember Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and changed the faith of the human family. Then he said, this is my body that is for you. On this night, Jesus raised the sacrament and the cup of wine, announced this is the life poured out for you, and transformed us into his disciples who were called to change the world. On this night, take us back to that room, Lord, allowing us to know Christ's presence in this hour. Amen. The living dramatization of Leonardo da Vinci's painting, The Last Supper, captures the moment when the word betray has fallen on the ears of the disciples. You will see expressions of human emotion expressed upon their faces, emotions of amazement, horror, grief, anger, and love. We present this not only for your enjoyment, but for you to ask yourself tonight, could it possibly be you that betrays the Christ? Are you asking... Is it I? Is it I? My name is James, but since many men bear this familiar name, I am known as James the Little or James the Lesser being lesser in size than other men of the same name. Since my father's name is Alpheus, I am sometimes known as James, son of Alpheus. Our family is a proud one, tracing its ancestry back to the tribe of Gad, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. I'll never forget the day I first saw the master. I was walking along the road near the place where John was baptizing. I was curious to see what was going on, so I turned aside for a closer look. There I saw John, Jesus asking John to baptize him. At first John refused, but Jesus insisted. After John had baptized the Lord, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon us in the form of a dove. And we heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Later, when Jesus called me to be one of his disciples, I followed him. And at the end of his first year of his public ministry, he chose me as one of the 12 apostles. Since that moment, I have walked with him and talked with him, stayed with him and prayed with him, trying to learn as much about him and his heavenly father as I could. And now one of us is to betray him? Surely it is madness to think that this could be. Surely the betrayer is out of his mind. But I keep asking myself, is it I? Is it I? James, my brother, thank you for your confidence in following me. You will have much work to do for my kingdom. Like Zacchaeus, I'm a tax collector. Some call me Levi. Others call me Matthew the publican. When my character changed through my relationship with Jesus, he changed my name as well. He called on me one day when I was collecting taxes in my office. He said, follow me. And I rose and followed him. Later, I gave him a great feast in my home where some of his disciples and my business friends were present. It was a royal occasion to entertain Jesus and his disciples. Some of the Pharisees complained about Jesus eating with publicans and sinners. And Jesus said, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, adding those words of Hosea, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And he added his significant words of his own, for I came not to call the righteous, 
but sinners to repentance. Since that day that I repented, I've studied the scriptures close to mine, convinced Jesus is the fulfillment of every prophecy of the coming Messiah, God's anointed. I've listened closely to the sermons, and someday I hope to write a paper proving he is the Messiah from our sacred writings and the heart of the sermon about the good news of the kingdom of God. It's the sermon he first delivered in the mountain in Galilee three years ago. It's good news for everybody, but yet he has just spoken bad news, tragic news that somebody tonight's going to betray it. Who could it be? Will they suspect me, the once hated tax collector? Is it I? Is it I? Ah, Matthew, you came so readily when I saw you in that tax collector's office. You put my kingdom above your money. My name is Nathaniel, although sometimes I'm called Bartholomew. Like some of the other disciples, I am a fisherman. My home is in Cana of Galilee, which is where Jesus did his first miracle of turning water to wine at a wedding feast. I was a disciple of John the Baptizer, and it was John who introduced me to Jesus at Bethany, just beyond the Jordan River. One day, my friend Philip came to me. He said, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets have wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I'll never forget the question I posed to Philip that day. What good can come out of Nazareth? I said this not in scorn or because Nazareth is a place of ill repute. I said it because... Nazareth is just such a little insignificant place that those of us who knew of its lanes and its alleys wondered why God would place his anointed in their midst. Well, be that as it may, Philip came and said, come and see. And when I saw Jesus, he looked at me and he said, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. I pondered this. I said, how do you know me? And he answered, before Philip called you, while you were under the fig tree, I saw you. See, in my country, when mothers would work in the fields, they would place their little babies in the shade of the nearest fig tree. It's these large leaves of the fig tree that shelter the babies from from the hot rays of the sun. Well, it was at this time that I declared my faith in him. Rabbi, I said, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Since then, I have followed him as a disciple and a chosen apostle. And together with the others, we have walked the villages of Galilee, the towns of the Decapolis, and the streets of the holy city, Jerusalem. And now, at a time when Jesus is instituting a ceremony to take the place of the Passover, he says that one of us will betray him? How can it be? How can a traitor be numbered amongst his friends? And now I ask myself, is it I? Is it I? You wondered, Nathaniel, if any good thing could come out of Nazareth. But you saw me, and you heard me, and you believed. I prophesied to you that you would see even greater things, and you will. Thank you for your trust in me. I'm Thomas. 
sometimes called Didymus, which means twin. And while I do not look upon life with mistrust and skepticism, I usually demand proof before I believe. I want to see before I commit to something. But I am not a man of doubt. In fact, I consider myself a man of daring. I recall that day when Mary and Martha sent word to the Lord that their brother Lazarus was sick. Jesus turned to us and said, let us go to him. We knew of the growing opposition to Jesus, and some of the apostles didn't want to go to Bethany. They shrank from the unseen danger. Yet I remember how I spoke out and rebuked them all by saying, let us also go with him that we may die with him. Why do people remember my doubts and forget my daring? Remember the questions and overlook the affirmations. Remember my fear and forget my faith. I used to go fishing with some of the others, and how well I remember the Beatitudes he preached on the horns of Haddon during the first year of his public ministry. And I could almost hear him rebuking the winds on the stormy sea of Galilee, preaching to the poor the good news. I can still see him healing the sick, opening the eyes of the blind, unstopping the ears of the deaf, and cleansing the lepers. Yet opposition has developed and grown to white heat. His enemies are determined to destroy him. Why? Because the God he reveals is a greater God than the petty little man-made deities they have enshrined upon their hearts and in their temples. He would bring us all up to God, while his enemies would cut God down to size. He would make us God's servants, while they would make God their servant. And now, he says that even among us, there is a traitor, amongst the chosen twelve. Is he speaking of me? Does he mean me? Is it I? Is it I? Thomas, Thomas. You always had so many questions, but I never turn away anyone who has questions. Just remember this, Thomas. The greatest question you ever asked was, how can we know the way? Again, I affirm to you that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Tradition states that James preached in Palestine and Egypt and was crucified in Egypt. Tradition records that Matthew died a martyr's death in Ethiopia. Tradition records that Nathaniel was a missionary in Armenia and was flayed or beaten to death for his faith. Tradition records that Thomas labored in Christ in Parthia, Persia, and in India. He suffered martyrdom near Madras at Mount St. Thomas. My name is Philip. I come from Bethsaida in Galilee. Several of my friends and I were in Bethany listening to John the Baptist when Jesus called upon us to become his followers, and we all turned and followed him. I remember I went after my companion, Nathaniel. I was so overjoyed when Jesus accepted him as a devoted follower. During these years of close fellowship with Jesus, my faith in God has become so strong and deep. I remember so well before he fed 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish, asking him and the others, where are we to buy bread that we may feed all of these people? Little did I know that he had already sent Andrew and his lunch to see Jesus. When the Greeks came to me and asked for a meeting with the master, I sent them to Andrew, and he brought them to Jesus. I've always wanted to know more, though, about the nature and the person of God. But when Jesus began to tell us that God was our Heavenly Father, it was almost beyond my understanding. However, as I've listened to the Master, I've grown to understand his words. In fact, I could almost say that 
Anyone who's seen Jesus has actually seen the Father. Because everything one wants to find in the Father, I do find in Jesus. And nothing I would not want to find in the Father do I find in Jesus. Now, having seen the Father through him, he's going to shock us and tell us there's a betrayer in our midst. Does the traitor not understand that by betraying him, he is betraying God? He's conspiring against him? Can one of our number be so blind? Who could it be? Could it even be Philip? Is it I? Is it I? You once said that you wanted to see the Father, Philip. And I assure you again that this night, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. After Jesus called Peter and Andrew to follow him, he came to me, John, and my brother James. We were in the boat nearby with our father Zebedee mending our nets. He called to us, and we immediately left the boat and our father and followed him. Sometimes, I believe, he is as much of God as will ever possess a human life. And at other times, I am tempted to believe that he is the God who existed prior to creation and will continue to exist after the end of time and the consummation of the age, that he is the word and that God would speak to every person of every age for all time to come. Yet, I love him as a person and he has returned my love. Sometimes, he calls me the beloved disciple I have shared his trials as well as his hours of victory. I was there on the Mount of Transfiguration, and we beheld his glory. He nicknamed James and me the Sons of Thunder. Yet we are not boisterous men, but quiet, hard workers. Though at times we may be a bit impatient of those who reject Jesus. Peter and I completed the arrangements for the celebration of the Passover here in this upper room tonight because he considers us among his close, intimate inner circle. It was me, he told, about his talk with Nicodemus when he spoke those wonderful words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Someday, I want to write down some of his sayings and some of his many wonderful deeds so that others may read them and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing they may have life in his name. Yet, he has just said that one of us was a betrayer, I cannot believe it. Yet it must be so, else he would not have said it. But who could it be? Surely not my brother, or Peter, or Andrew. Could it be John, the beloved disciple? Is it I? Lord, is it I? John, my beloved disciple. You were always open to revelation. You were with me on the Mount of Transfiguration where you beheld my glory. I trust that you will write many of these things down for others to know. John, will you accompany me tonight to the Garden of Gethsemane? I need your support again, even this night. Yes, I will, my Lord. I am Simon, the zealot. Before Jesus called me, I belonged to a group of hot-headed, bloodthirsty revolutionaries known as the zealots. Oh, we were all for armed rebellion against Rome. We believed in crushing our enemies under our hills, and establishing the ancient glory that was once Israel's in the days of David and Solomon. Yet, Jesus told us of another kind of kingdom, the kingdom of the human heart where God reigns there supremely. 
And since I've heard him, I've changed my mind and my allegiance. He has shown me that the conquest of the human heart is the only true, sincere, and lasting conquest. So, I've given him my highest loyalty and deepest devotion. And I have, in a military way of thinking, unconditionally and completely surrendered myself to him. To think his thoughts. To love as he loves and whom he loves. To obey as he obeys. And to serve as he serves. Now this surrender, it hasn't imprisoned me, yet it has set me free for the first time in my life. I'm not afraid of Rome any longer. Sure, Rome is big and mighty, but God is almighty. And we will conquer Rome by outliving and outloving her in the name of God, whom Jesus has revealed unto us. Jesus, whom we call our master and our savior. But now, the master says there is a spiritual Roman among us. One who would attempt by force what can only be conquered with by love. But who could it be? Matthew, the publican? Uh, the big fisherman and his brother. No. Or does he suspect me? Since I'm the only former zealot among us, who could it be? Is it I? Is it I? Simon, <laughs> I know when you began following me that your heart was filled with hatred toward Rome, but now it is filled with love. <laughs> Thank you for your allegiance to my kingdom. My brother Andrew and I were fishing in the Sea of Galilee. We were casting our nets into the sea when one afternoon when Jesus walked up to us and told us to drop our nets and follow him and he would make us fisher of men. We immediately dropped our nets and we followed him. As we followed him, he used our boats one afternoon to make a wayside pulpit to speak to the great multitude who was following him. It was so magnificent to see all those people surrounding the shore. And as we traveled, we continued to fish. One morning, he told us to take our boats way out into the seas and drop our nets. We were very tired. We had fished all night long, and it caught nothing. But I said, at your wish, my Lord, I will take our boats out. We dropped our nets. We caught so many fish. I had to summon boats nearby to help us to contain the catch. When we got back to shore, I dropped to my knees. I said, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. But he, he told us there after that, he was going to make us fishers of men. In fact, he even changed my name from Simon to Peter, which means the rock. When I confessed him as Christ, the son of the living God, near, the, near Caesarea Philippi, he says, on this rock, I will build my church. Moments later, I protested against him going to Jerusalem to suffer the death at the hands of evil men. He rebuked me and says, get behind me, Satan. So I'm a mixture of good and evil, godliness and devilness. But I want to prove to him that my love and loyalty and devotion are sincere and genuine. Tonight, he said, that one of us would betray him. I promised to follow him even unto death. But he warned me that before the cock crows twice, I would have denied him three times. He prayed for me because he said that Satan wanted me so he could sift me like wheat. Even though the others called me the big fisherman, 
in his presence, I felt so small and unworthy. I felt, will I deny him tonight before the rooster crows? And if so, what will he do? Will he disown me? Will he deny me? Will he close the doors of the kingdom to me? Was he refusing, was he referring to me when he said, one of you will betray me? If I knew the scoundrel who, I would pierce his heart with this knife I hold in my hand. But maybe it would be my own heart I would pierce. God, grant it may not be so. Yea, I keep wondering and saying to myself, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Ah, Peter, even when I first asked you to join the group, I saw you as a leader. You have those special qualities that I can tell will help spread the good news around the world. Indeed, you denied knowing that you knew me. But I love you, and I forgive you. Tradition says that Philip preached the gospel in Pergia and died a martyr's death in Hierapolis. Tradition affirms that John labored among the churches of Asia Minor, especially at Ephesus. He wrote the Gospel of John in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the Book of Revelation. He was banished to the Isle of Patmos, afterward freed, and is the only one of the twelve to die a natural death. Western tradition says that Simon the Zealot was martyred for his faith in Persia. Tradition records that Peter was martyred by being crucified upside down at his request, not feeling worthy to be crucified as Christ was. I am James, the brother of John. I followed Jesus with my brother after he called us while we were mending our nets by the Sea of Galilee with our father Zebedee one day, almost three years ago. Oh, we were proud when he wanted us as disciples and humbled when he chose both of us to be among the 12 apostles. We were with Jesus in Peter's home when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of her fever. Later, in the home of Jairus, we saw Jesus raise his little daughter from the sleep of death. On the Mount of Transfiguration, we saw Jesus talking with Moses And Elijah. Oh, our mother Salome was quite ambitious on our behalf, and she urged us to press our claims upon him. Why, en route to Jerusalem last week, we asked him, Teacher, grant that one of us may sit at your right and the other your left when you enter into your kingdom. And he answered, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the cup I am to drink from and be baptized with the baptism I am to be baptized with? And we answered him, Lord, we are able. And then he said that surely we would drink from his cup and be baptized with his baptism. But it wasn't in his power to grant this right and privilege of sitting at his right and left hand in his kingdom. All the others were angry when they heard of our request. But Jesus told them that he who is to be first must first be the servant of all. And he demonstrated these words by washing our feet just before tonight's supper. Once when the people of a certain Samaritan village did not greet Jesus the way we thought that they should, we urged him to call fire down from heaven and destroy them. But Jesus rebuked us as only he could and taught us that God's way was always one of love. Now, He who taught us the way of love is to be deceived by one of those whom he loved? How could this be? Why would one of us do such a thing? But deep within my own heart, I ask, is it I? Is it I? James, 
you requested to sit with me, with your brother John on my right hand and you on my left in my glory. But then I prophesied to you of this hour when I said, you shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. I also said, and I say again, whoever of you will be the greatest must be the servant of all. You must understand, James, I did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as ransom for many. I'm Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, the man who first brought his own brother to meet the Lord. I'm not a gifted man. I'm just an ordinary, average man like any one of you. But I've tried to do what I could to serve the Master with the gifts and the talents that I do have. The others, they call me Andrew the Bringer because it seems all I have ever done is to bring someone else to Jesus. I brought my brother Peter to Jesus, and I've gloried in the gradual transformation in his life. Also, I found that little lad with the five loaves and the two fish that day when Jesus fed the 5,000. And as I watched him feed so many with so little, and everyone eat until he was filled, I was glad in my heart that I brought the lad to the Lord. And then, just recently, some Greeks came seeking the Master. And I was called on once again to bring the Greeks to Jesus. You know, he must have seen something of value in me that the others overlooked because he selected me to be one of his 12 disciples. I've been very close to the Master ever since. We've shared many a triumph and many a tragedy. I know in my heart that he is truly the Lamb of God. I may not be in the inner circle like my brother Peter, but I'm not in the outer circle either. I've been a friend and a companion to my Lord, and what greater gift could life afford a fisherman? But, but now one of us is to betray him. How could that be? Who could it be? How could he get away with it in his own heart? Could it be Andrew the bringer? Is it I? Is it I? Andrew, I commend you for one of the greatest acts of faith that can ever be performed. You brought your own brother to me. Thank you for your witness, Andrew. It will prove to mean much to my kingdom. Thaddeus, um, I am a disciple that was chosen to be uh, one of Christ's apostles. The twelve tribes of the Israel took the name of the ten of the sons of Jacob, who was renamed Israel, and two of the sons of Jacob's favorite sons, Joseph, who were named Ephraim and Manassas. In like manner, Jesus chose the twelve of us to become the cornerstones of the new kingdom, just as the 12 tribes were cornerstones of the old Jewish kingdom. I feel unworthy to be numbered among the apostles, but he selected me. I well remember the day after a night in prayer. He called us to him. He gave us authority over unclean uh, spirits and the power to heal every kind of disease and infirmity. Then he commissioned us to go forth and preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He told us to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves, since he was sending us forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. It is enough, he said, that the disciple be like this this teacher and the servant as his master. I was in Jerusalem when he gave the greatest invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And now he who came to share man's burdens has burden thrust upon him. 
the knowledge of one of us will betray him. Which one of us can it be? Who is the traitor? The least suspected among us? Or will all of us betray him before this night is over? Philip, Peter, Judas, John, even Thaddeus. Is it I? Is it I? Thaddeus, I shared with you how I would manifest myself to you and not to the world. Tonight, in this very act, I am manifesting myself to you in a way that the world will never understand or see. I am Judas, known in all of history as the man who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and betrayed him with a kiss. I received my call to be a, an apostle by the Sea of Tiberias, and I was a man of great ambition, and so I didn't follow Jesus for spiritual motives. No, no, no. I had plans. I had a desire for gain of a sordid nature, and I was a man of, of no little ability. I, I was the treasurer for these whole group of apostles. <laughs> I, I hid my true motives from the other apostles by pretending I was zealous for my administration. And so when Mary, she came and wanted to anoint Jesus' feet. And I said, I protested, I said, no, why don't we sell this ointment for 300 shillings and give it to the poor? <laughs> ah, I hid my motives from all of the other apostles, but I could not fool Jesus. And yet he was patient with me and one time he said, have I not chosen you twelve personally, and yet one of you is a devil? Jesus. Jesus knew my motives. But <laughs> the others did not. They, they didn't know I was a traitor until Jesus was forced to give me the cup, and he offered it to me, and he said, what you do, do quickly. And Satan entered my heart. And I turned my back on the master. And I went out into the night. And I sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. And I led the angry mob into the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he was kneeling in prayer. And I led them to him. And I betrayed him with a kiss. And when I kissed him, he called me friend. His words of love, they pierced my heart. And my heart sank within me. And my face it burned with anger of a traitor. My revenge was satisfied. But I realized that I had made a horrible mistake. And I was sorry for what I had done. And yet, I, I was a spiritual coward. I, I couldn't go to, to him for a second chance. I knew he would give me a second chance. He had given Peter a second chance. But I wouldn't go. I, I played with sin until it just consumed me. And now my tragic end is known to the whole world. <laughs> Judas, if only you had repented. I came to save all mankind. I died for you.
Tradition says that James preached in Jerusalem and Judea and was beheaded by Herod in A.D. 44. Tradition says that Andrew preached in Sethia, Greece, in Asia Minor. He was crucified for his faith. Tradition says that Thaddeus preached in Assyria and Persia and died a crucified death in Persia. The Bible tells us that when Judas learned that Jesus had been condemned, remorse filled his soul. And he hurried to the chief priests and elders with the anguish cry that he had betrayed an innocent man. The priest dismissed his protest with contempt. Judas threw down their bribe, 30 pieces of silver, and went off and hanged himself. temptation but deliver us from evil for the much like tonight as Jesus was betrayed he was with his disciples and he took the bread and he blessed it he appealed to his father and he said this is my body broken for you take this and do this in remembrance of me
in the same way, he took the cup and he clearly stated, this is the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. For whoever partakes of the bread and the cup is affirming Jesus' death and that he will come again.